Welcome to Let's Chew the Gum. I'm your host, Protocol. We're talking about a lot of things in this show while we chew the gum. And as always, on each and every show, we always have something for your mind. Welcome to Let's Chew the Gum, the podcast where we talk about everything from A to Z. I'm your host, Protocol, and in the studio today, we have a very special guest to speak with you about issues that affect our daughters, our sons, our families, our communities, and we really think you're going to enjoy this useful information. My guest today will be Terry Boykins of Street Positive. Unfortunately, today, we encountered some heavy traffic or some type of technical difficulty. So the session you're about to hear will have less than perfect audio quality. It won't be our usual sound format or not even the sound you're hearing now. However, we didn't let technology get in the way. We patched in the sound and you will hear the first portion of this session with part two soon to come. We thank you for joining us. Let's go. Okay, welcome to another edition of Let's Chew the Gum, the podcast where we talk about everything from A to Z while we chew the gum. Who says you can't chew gum and talk? I think you can. I think it's a, a good thing. It gives you rhythm and focus. You can find this podcast on all platforms, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Spotify. If you'd like to support the show, please go to anchor.fm slash protocol. That's P R O. T-K-A-L-L, and feel free to donate 99 cents, 4.99, or 9.99 a month, or just drop us a line. Also, feel free to call into the show anytime for topics you want to discuss or to be a guest. Today, I have a very special guest that I'm glad to have on the show. We have Mr. Terry Boykins. He is the C- a CEO or stakeholder, at least, in the Daughters Lives Matter movement. You can find more information at DaughtersLivesMatter.com. So let's um, go ahead and, and bring in uh, Mr. Boykins. Uh, we're going to have a great discussion to get today. Uh, so uh, listen in. Welcome, Mr. Boykins. How are you? Dr. Quanta, thank you. I appreciate you having me on your show. I mean, it, it definitely was a pleasure and, and something that I wanted to do from the very beginning of me having this show. You know, we, we met a few years back and, and I knew you were doing great things. And, and the topics that, that you share and that you host on your site are, are relevant, man. And so those are the types of things and the type of information we want to put out to the listeners. I had a, a distinct pleasure in listening to one of your shows last night, and, and maybe we'll talk about that a little bit later. But first, tell, tell the audience about a little bit about yourself and about the Daughters Lives Matter movement. Well, Street Positive, uh, which is one of the stakeholders in the Daughters Lives Matter movement, uh, was established in 1997. And the reason why it was established is because uh, after leaving corporate America, uh, I found myself being confronted with individuals that were approaching me to help fund their respective agency or their particular mission as relates to child maltreatment. Coming out of corporate America wasn't really engaged because I was focusing on things of Wall Street or doing business with Fortune 500 companies. And so whatever I could do, um, giving back to the community, growing up in the inner city, having had a chance to become a corporate executive and then have some resources to make a difference. um, It became very interesting to become aware of how many children were being neglected or abused. And so Street Positive began to work with different organizations, uh, one of which had to do with some hip-hop artists that were really in the cut back in the 80s and 90s um, using hip-hop for social causes before all the gangster rap got into it and 
Um, this was really about them doing their business, about putting the message out. And one of the things we had a chance to put our message out about was about not abusing the sexually uh, molesting children. And so we did a piece called Safe and Sound in Our Town, which was a big hit. I had a chance to become the executive producer, underwrite that. And it went on to sell um, about 800,000 copies just on the street. And we were moving the CD for five dollars all over the country that people were buying and then they were buying it and giving it out and people were buying it um, because of the message and of course that hip-hop beat was in it and so from there uh street positive began to engage uh in different capacities but more importantly uh the fatherhood component uh, which i started getting tapped for as a result of working with social workers and particularly Caucasian social workers that were sharing with me about, do you know what's going on? And I was like, well, sort of. <laughs> it wasn't really right, like right. I understood the question. You know what I mean? I know what's going on. You know, what time is it? Uh, but they said, do you know what's going on? And so they started sharing with me about the trends in incarceration, about black males. Did you re remember what happened back in the seventies when they were keeping men from coming around the house and so forth. And men were trying to make money to take care of their kids. And then all of a sudden the incarceration game got put into place. And then when that started being discussed, I got it. So men were out of the home, out of the family, young Young men were being exposed to the game on the street, banging on the street, dealing on the street, swinging, swinging on the street. And they were now creating this whole pathway to prison. And the correlation between if you take, and this is what a social worker told me, if we can remove the man from the home, we can control communities for generations about that and, and i think that would be true of, of any group anywhere in the world if you can if you remove the the leadership absolutely and that let, let, let me let me let me go the word. I'm, I'm sorry sure. I'm, I'm sorry mr uh, mr boy because I, I wanted to go back a minute because you you dropped a lot of useful information and I, and i want to to just make sure it's out there so so first let me correct myself <clears throat> street positive the relationship with Daughters' Lives Matter is street positive. Your organization is a contributor to that group. Is that correct? Yes, contributor and the founder. Contributor and founder. Ex excellent. And we're, we're definitely going to talk more about that. The next thing you that I wanted to reflect on is you talked about the song, the hip hop song. And, and you know, I, I'm from the early hip hop generation where it was also about a message. You know, you had brag rap, but the message was the core. And that's what brought the people together. It's like the, the beating of the drum. Here's the, here's the message, the town riot. Right. And so Correct. The, the particular song you said, I, I want to just let everybody know again. What's the name of the song? Safety for the name is Safe and Sound in Our Town. Safe and sound in our town. Okay, all right. Safe and sound in our town. No, I like that. Man, eight hundred thousand copies. That's that's impressive, and, and I'm sure it, it is a song that may resonate today. So if, if it's still out there and available, people can go and look it up and, and just take a listen. I think hip hop today is is missing a lot of that message. Um, you also talked about fatherhood, and and I just wanted to reflect on that when you talk to, you said, a, a, a colleague or social worker who happened to be Caucasian. And I was just thinking that, you know, in these times, whether it's Caucasian to Black or Vietnamese to South Korean, whatever it may be, anytime there is a potential for um, a cultural disconnect, and disconnects don't have to be cultural, but anytime there's a disconnect culturally or, or a translation needed, I think it's so important that people reach out across cultural lines. And I, I, too, have had um, individuals who are Caucasian that would approach me and ask me, and, and I appreciated their humility and honesty in saying that we need someone that understands, right? Rather than trying to administer medicines for something you don't know, you ask someone in the know and let them help. So this idea that they were able to reach out to you in that way and then you t to be able to pick up the information and solidify it into a, a movement to, to, you know, rectify the problem is is Great. And and you mentioned social services and, and men being out of the home. And I do remember that. 
uh, where if you need, I mean, it, it's a situation where you, you're you're too poor to be rich and and too rich to be poor. You don't qualify. And so <laughs> you had you had you had people who were needing maybe some social assistance, but if they received it, there couldn't be a working man in the home. Well, that that pretty much was a predominant thing for many poor communities, and and unfortunately, the African American community at that time and place was a maybe a, amongst the highest percentage wise. Obviously, Caucasian Americans overall were the majority, but the idea that no man in the home, so you can't be with there, be there with your kids to raise them, to provide guidance, to pimp proof them, as you'll talk about later, and, and it, it reminds me of a movie, Claudine. If anyone hasn't seen that movie, it's a perfect example where she's trying to make it. She has lots of kids. You have a, a pretty good man who comes in, a, a garbage worker who's trying to help out, but because she receives welfare, she can't even have a a, a, boy, a boyfriend or a man around the house. So that's important. And and that leading to incarceration. And it's just a plethora of things that you laid down. So I just wanted to reflect on those for a minute and highlight them because they're important. But uh, Absolutely. Yeah, please continue. Go ahead, continue. Well, and so this basically gave me a, a perspective. Uh, once again, coming from um, – Corporate America, having come from the inner city, become formally educated, received three degrees, went into corporate America, came out of corporate America. So you 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 transcend from the hood, you know, you which is progressing from where you come from. But now, you know, you get a chance to have a moment where you can stop and start realizing where you do come from and what really were the issues while you were away. And while you are making your money, a lot of stuff is still going on in the hood. Um, and so what I began to realize is that there was inactivity with the real issues, the root cause of things, the trauma, the domestic violence, the sexual abuse that your sister was dealing with or your cousin was dealing with, uh, or in some cases that young man was dealing with and things just wasn't getting talked about. And so as I began to push some more money and the resources and supporting things, it became more obvious that we got a problem and we got a problem that is greater than all the things that are going on in the moment that the media is saying and the destruction and the collapse of the family was happening right between right before our eyes. And so as I l looked at this fatherhood, Philip Jackson um, from the black star project, um, God rest his soul, uh, who passed away just a couple of years ago, had contacted me and said, hey, look, I know you're doing some things with fatherhood on the West Coast. Uh, I want to talk about bringing the Million Father March. Uh, this is the early stage, 2004, 2005, uh, after right. they had met. And so I had a chance to, you know, pull some folks together out here on the West Coast uh, from Northern California, Arizona, Southern Cal, the IE, um, and uh, Long Beach, I mean, all throughout, and, and, and we put on, you know, that expansion. But it was, of course, taking their fathers, taking their children to the first day of school. And the impact that makes on both the educators as well as the peers of their children, something about the presence of men in the community on a school campus, the first day of school, sends a message that daddy's in the house and so whatever else you want to think that you can get away with just remember daddy is in the house with a child so if the bully's on campus and he or she sees all those men walking their kids their attitude about attacking that one child because they're gonna remember that day i gotta watch myself because they got a daddy over there and so Absolutely. bullies this is why we was rolling like that. And so even with regards to even teachers about treating kids a certain way, something about a teacher knowing there's a father that's in the equation is going to think differently about how they deal with that child because they know there's a father around. And so the power of that became very reticent. So as time went on, fast forward to Daughters Lives Matter. <sighs> A lot of the work I had been doing, and of course, gone on to do with mentoring, was recognized around the country for the different mentoring programs, and had a chance to connect with um, Campaign for Black Male Achievement. Shout out to um, Sean Dove with the uh, Campaign for Black Male Achievement, the Rumble in Louisville, Kentucky at the Muhammad Ali Center. But 
more and more people kept saying, Terry, what about fathers and daughters? And I was really focusing on the father, son, the manhood component. Right. And I had been watching back in the early 2000s, some shifts started occurring from coming out of the drug game, uh, what was on the street in terms of how cartels were moving. And of course, the, 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 the black gangs um, were basically getting pushed out of that business into pimping and sex trafficking. And I started looking at that. And I had been exposed to some of that back in Las Vegas years ago. And that's how Daughters Lives Matter ended up really paying attention to what was going on with father-daughter relationships. No, that, that's outstanding, man. And, and, and it's, it's, it's very important. And I'm glad that, that you were motivated and, or had the insight to, to, to think about that. Because oftentimes, you know, it is focused on the male aspect. But focusing on that father-daughter relationship is important. And and going back to your previous point, when when the male was absent or forced out of the home, you know that father-daughter relationship suffered. And the result of of what we were left with in terms of leaderless males trying to raise themselves, those became the new or the the refashioned role models that were incomplete because they didn't have the, the father component. And and man, that that just makes the, an atmosphere ripe for abuse and mistreatment for, from a lack of understanding and knowledge, but also um, from a predatory standpoint as well. Well, let me tell you, uh, Doctor, the environment was perfect. How this got set up was absolutely phenomenal. Fathers being discouraged of participating and providing for their family. The risk of trying to do that by getting into the drug game, making that money, paying for those diapers, trying to put some food in the in the, uh, in the refrigerator, and then the industrial prison industrial complex of packing prisons uh, with people of color, men of color, particularly African American men uh, and Hispanic men, and then being in an environment where that affirmation of trafficking of meeting the demand, the sexual appetite and demand for young girls in America with no covering. And so so you have no covering on one end, you got supply and demand, and then you've got the uh, the broker, the pimp, who's the broker in the game. And so it was about that money, and it was about that money to a point where the affirmation title of the daughter be referring to the pimp as daddy. Absolutely. How about that? So <laughs> now talk about it. you follow me? Absolutely. And so the, the, the environment was right to fill that daddy role, but doing the wrong thing. But the affirmation, the youth, it was absolutely phenomenal how, all these pieces started coming together, and I was like, we got a problem. We got a huge problem because we've normalized for a girl to call a pimp daddy. Yeah, on that note, on that note, we, we really have to let that sink in and let, the, let our listeners you know, really hear that and let that sink in. You're listening to Let's Chew the Gum, the podcast where we talk about everything from A to Z. You can find us on all social media platforms, YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Breaker, Breaker, Podbean, et cetera. You can find our guest, Mr. Terry Boykins, at streetpositive.com. Check out the website, daughterlivesmatter.com. We're going to take a quick break for our sponsors, and we'll be back with more and to talk about some of the things that were are being implemented as solutions. We'll be right back. You've been listening to Let's Chew the Gum, the podcast where we talk about everything from A to Z and where we'd like to hear from you. If you have an idea for a show, you want to hear a topic discussed, or you'd like to be a guest on the show, feel free to email us at let's chew the gum at gmail.com or at protocol at gmail.com. 
Unfortunately, due to some unforeseen circumstances, we're going to have to have this show continue in a part two that we will air very shortly. Please come back to join this conversation, this most important conversation with my special guest, Terry Boykins of Street Positive. And remember, we always have 